Hey there everybody and welcome back to another Blender tutorial where we're making, not simulations, even though it looks like a simulations, but um, in fact this is a geometry nodes driven kind of DVD player kind of animation where the things hit the corners and they collide and stuff like that. Uh, if you haven't seen my DVD problem video I released over on the CG Matter channel just a bit ago, I'd recommend watching that uh, before this one because unlike other geometry node tutorials I've made, uh, this one is, how do we say it, fucking insane. Okay, we've never done this many nodes. We've never done anything this like kind of level of complexity uh, So I would say watch the video prepare yourself uh, for it because we're somehow making this uh, deterministic Collision system. So even though it looks like there's physics, there's not any um, so uh, for this tutorial I would say uh, be prepared to pause be prepared to rewind to kind of really think through things because it's not simple um, but it is uh, rewarding. So I'm gonna show you kind of the basics or the bare bone idea uh, behind how we make something like this. But before we begin, uh, there's a sponsor for this video, a very cool little game. Uh, so we'll talk about that and then uh, the tutorial. Okay, so I've jumped several days ahead in the future, which is kind of the weird thing. I can record this whenever I want, but you see it all linearly as if like I've captured a moment in time. Either way, uh, this video is sponsored by Ace Defender, which is an SRPG masterpiece. What is SRPG? It's an RPG role-playing game turn-based uh, with ES meaning strategic, in this case, tower defense. That's the combination of these two things. Ace Defender has 40 plus chapters, which is nearly 2,000 levels. It's a long, long game you can play for a long, long time. With 48 heroes, each with their own deep background stories, and there's two heroes added to the game every two weeks, so this thing's being constantly updated. You can level up, combine heroes, and equip gear to create a powerful lineup. In terms of gameplay modes, we have PvE, we have PvP, and for both of these, you can speed up the game by one, two, four times to, you know, speed up the parts that you want to kind of chug through, or you could slow it down and play to your kind of desire. For the PvE, which we call Expedition Mode, you can explore dungeons and regions, engage in trials, level up your heroes, and collect rare items. And for PvP, player versus player, fight against other players within your server or across servers in different arenas. And hello, Brenda. Brenda the Demon Spear is, you know, the full name. Welcome, Brenda. Brenda the Demon Spear is a new hero with the ability to deal massive damage in both PvE and PvP battles, limit her opponent's damage, and recover health on her own. Brenda, Brenda's the whole package, what can I say? And as for new features being added to the game, Realm of Deities, this is the big deal. This is the new feature being added to the game where you can build your own castle, develop technology, and train soldiers to conquer the city for endless treasures. It just does not end. On the Realm of Deities map, you can defeat all kinds of monsters and get rewards, fight together with your allies, and gain even more power for your heroes through the magical research. And for people just getting the game, like you guys, link in the description, you can download the game. You are going to get 10 royal recruit tickets. That's after you do chapter 2 level 8, I believe. And you can access these tickets by clicking Sky City, then go to Tavern, and then go to Recruit 10X. So guys, Ace Defender is here. You can download it by clicking the link in the description. Check it out. Try the new heroes. Try the new game types. It's a thing to do if you're interested in finding a new game and playing a new thing. So check it out. Okay, we are back. For you, it's been some amount of time. For me, it's been two seconds. I stand here, and I'm like, one, two, Okay, it's passed and I hit the desk and whatever. Um, so again, what we're making is this kind of collision simulation. Right now I have it set so that, you know, each one's going in a direction pre-assigned by a noise texture. Um, but this can be kind of mapped to like a single direction so that they're all going to the top right, for example, or uh, whatever. Again, make sure you watch the CG Matter video for context. But you can see a lot of nodes, but it's not actually as complicated as it looks. But it is complicated. Well, whatever. Let's just start. Um, for this, I'm gonna be using 3.1 alpha. Uh, if you see <clears throat> any nodes that you do not have in your 3.0 build, uh, try to upgrade. I think the only node that I'm actually gonna be using that you might not have access to is a um, kind of a time node that was recently added that gives us the frame number instead of adding in a driver, but it doesn't matter. You could do it in 3.0. So let's make this thing. Geometry nodes, make a geo nodes group for our cube. And as always, delete the cube. So what do we have so far? Uh, we have kind of a invisible, in some sense, cube with a geometry nodes modifier described by this node group. And the question is, what is the node group that exactly describes this collision thing that's going on? Well, let's take it step by step. First of all, uh, we need a sphere or a circle or a particle that can collide around. So let's just start with that. 
Uh, one way to approach this is you could just try adding in a UV sphere, uh, which makes sense, right? You have this particle and we could uh, assign movement to it in this deterministic way using a you know transform node. Uh, but I'm actually not going to be doing it like this because if you think about what is a UV sphere, it's a set of points, quite a few actually, and we'd need to program each one of these and you'll understand what that means soon. Um, so I want something somehow even simpler than a sphere is how we're, we're going to begin. So I, I just want to make sure we have our good... Uh, primitive setup. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use a mesh line, which kind of seems like a strange move. I'm going to set the count to one. So I want you to kind of interpret this as a single point, like a single vertex floating in space. And then kind of cute little trick, I'm going to instance on points. In other words, I'm going to instance on our only point, a sphere. So in other words, we're still using a sphere. Uh, but the difference here is the position isn't going to be determined by a transform node. Uh, but instead by a set position node, right? So we have a point, we're setting its position, we're moving it, and then we're pasting a sphere onto there. What's the difference? Why does it matter? This is a better because now not only can we, you know, have more points, obviously, so I increase the count, we have a bunch of spheres, um, but more importantly, uh, the rules and kind of the fake physics we're going to do are much easier to calculate on a single point than on the set of points for a sphere. So we're going to calculate... Uh, all our fields kind of ram it into the position. I don't, I don't know why I say ram it in. This isn't like a uh, hardcore bondage scene, but we're ramming it in. Think about it like ramming in the gates of a castle. What the fuck are we talking about? Uh, it's easier to talk about single points than to talk about entire geometry. So that's why we're doing it. Um, so now the next question is, I'm going to make this a bit smaller, uh, that we, now that we have our system, uh, how do we define these offset and position rules to make it look correct? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a fake kind of collision system, which kind of uses actual collision uh, logic. So if you think about it, we want the sphere kind of colliding inside a screen. In other words, kind of like a rectangle or a cube. Um, so we want to make a cube and we want to have some kind of detection saying if we're going in this direction, when is it going to collide and what direction should it go off to? And we need to do that every time there's a collision. So starting off with our screen, I'm going to approximate this thing with a cube. Uh, why a cube instead of a grid? Good question. Um, in my experimentation, I found that this is better because it's a thing that actually has thickness on the z-axis, even though screen's two-dimensional. Go figure. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to make it 1.778. Why? Uh, because uh, most screens are in a 16 by 9 ratio. So if you take 16 and divide it by 9, you'll find that it's 1.7778. So this is our screen, um, except in reality, it's three-dimensional. But it's not actually something we need to see. It's just something that needs to exist in the background so we can calculate our physics, okay? So, so far, we have our point that, again, we have a sphere pasted onto. I'm going to make it a bit smaller. And we have our screen. Uh, let's send this thing flying in a certain direction and calculate where it's going to hit on our screen. Uh, to do this, we're going to be using a raycast node, and this is actually the bread and butter of this uh, node system, because raycast lets us literally cast out a ray in a direction we pick, and it's going to see where is it going to collide with the geometry, right? Um, so let's just kind of go through the inputs here. Raycast, what's the target geometry? What do we want it to hit? The cube, right? We want to see where is it going to hit the screen. Next, what is the source position? In other words, where do we start? Uh, well, by default, it's just going to use the uh, position input, even if we don't have it like explicitly written here. So that's fine. It's using position. As for the ray, the ray direction, this is something we have quite a bit of control over. Uh, so I'm going to make a custom vector. And again, if you saw the video, I'm going to say, let's say that our vector kind of goes like that. So we're sending it flying that way. Um, in that case, it would be something like 1, 1 is the vector. So it's going 1 to the right, 1 upward. So it makes this kind of diagonal thing but you could pick any vector you want okay so uh, what this should return is we have a single point that's being casted on this cube in this direction and we want to know where it's going to go well it should go to this hit position it's already done the calculation so let's see if that worked to actually visualize this we're going to need to um kind of have our animation happen through this set position so let's see we move it right here and boom you can see that uh, the sphere has gone to where uh, the screen would have been. So you can see right there. Um, if we join these, you can actually see what's going on. So if I was to take our initial position, and I'm going to mix it with this new one, so I'm just adding in some nodes here. I'll explain it in a second. Just adding in nodes. Uh, we start right here from the middle, 
and then we do our ray cast calculation and it gets sent all the way over here. And depending on our vector, it's gonna cast uh, on the uh, different part of the screen. So it's kind of being sent in a direction and we're finding the intersection with the screen, okay? So super simple stuff. What have I done here? Um, we're using set position to explicitly say, hey, uh, move our particle. And this mixing is just mixing between the original position and our calculated uh, hit position, okay? So, so far, if we wanted to do an animation, we just kind of keyframe this and it would look like it's moving in a direction. Fine. Um, however, kind of the next step in this animation, if we're kind of treating it as a step-by-step -step process, is now we need this thing to collide and not just randomly, right? We need it to collide with kind of the correct angle uh, going outward. So how do we now add a second part to this animation? So this is where it gets a bit tricky. But if you can wrap your head around this, then you're golden because we're just going to repeat what I'm about to show you. So we have this thing coming in this way and we want it going out this way. Uh, to calculate its next position, we are again going to raycast. Nothing has changed. It's almost as if now we're starting the problem again, but we're here and we need to know which vector we're going towards. So again, uh, we're raycasting towards which geometry? Again, the screen. We're always colliding with the screen. What is our source position? Where are we starting? Well, this time, it's not the same as before, where we could just have kind of this position input that we don't even need to show. Uh, this time, our position is here, right? The traveling's already happened. So we need to take our hit position and connect it. So it's kind of taking uh, the previous information and sending it into the future, kind of this recursive thing. Also, the ray direction is no longer going to be the same as our original uh, vector that was going this way, uh, but we need the uh, reflection, right, as if it's reflected here. How do we get it? Uh, well, there's actually vector math for this. So vector math, we're going to set it to reflect, uh, which kind of is the thing that would make sense. You'd want the reflection vector, so you type in reflect, beautiful, it exists. That's how I found it, right? Uh, so we want to take our vector from before, which is no longer correct, right? We want to take it and reflect it off of kind of our surface normal. In this case, it looks like this. So we want to flip it. Well, how do we get our surface normal? That's a good question. Uh, if only there was a little something. Oh, hit normal. So we have all the information we need. Take this, reflect it off the hit normal. So again, the hit normal is basically this vector. It's the normal uh, to the surface where we have our collision. So this reflection uh, exactly shows us the new ray direction. And uh, how do we, again, visualize if this works? We're going to add another mix node. So this is the next position in the chain. And we're going to do a hit position. So you can see now it's uh, calculated the exact thing that it should have done. And if we, I'm going to get rid of all this uh, sketching now. If we now take this step by step, originally it's at position. Then we want to animate it over to the first ray cast hit position. And then we want to animate it to the second ray cast hit position. And this is the idea, right? We've actually done a collision. Uh, we just need to actually animate this thing. But uh, you can see the logic is... Uh, kind of this repetitive thing. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do one more collision. Uh, we'll do three or four something total. Um, I did five or six in my original, but I just wanna kind of establish a pattern. Uh, I'm gonna call this available on Patreon, although you are gonna get access to the original blend file that has all the settings and all this. This is just a basic version. Uh, so check out the Patreon link in the description if you don't wanna make this yourself, but just wanna play with the finished version. Um, but again, let's do another calculation. So we want to now, it went this way. Now it should bounce this way, most likely, right? Uh, not most likely, it will. Uh, so we need another ray cast. Same thing every time for every collision. And this is why I was talking about the loop node in the other video, so that we don't have to literally add these nodes over and over. It'd be nice to have a loop node. But either way, we want to reflect with the screen or collide with the screen. That's where we're casting our rays. What is the source position? Well, it is this altered uh, position again, because first it was here. Then it's here, so this is our new initial coordinate. Again, make sure you understand that concept. For the ray direction, again, it's updated. Uh, but this time, we're not reflecting the original like we did before. But we are reflecting the reflection. So each time, our initial changes, right? We're using previous information to go to the next iteration. So first we have this, then the reflection, then the reflection of the reflection with this new hit normal. Whoops. So it's just kind of the same pattern. You just have to wrap your head around it. That's the ray direction. And then to add this step to our chain, just another mix to our set position chain and connect. 
but not to the factor. Okay, so something went wrong clearly because it's going to the middle. Let's debug live. Um, let's see. So we have our target geometries. Oh, it's hit distance. Well, that was a fast debug. Make sure you're connecting the right thing to the right thing. I thought that might have been a teachable moment, and I guess it was. Okay. No, we still do have an issue. Okay, now it let now let's figure out what it is. Uh, so we have our geometry, source position, da da da. Okay, so everything. This is actually very important because I ran into this issue in the original. Um, it seems like everything is correct. We've literally just repeated this process, yet yet it's uh, not working. This is a bug that uh, took me a while to figure out. So what's happening here is our particle is exactly on the screen, and we wanted to cast out on this new reflection, right? Just repeat the process. What's happening here is when it's trying to kind of cast out this ray, it's hitting this uh, screen immediately, even though it's exactly on it. Um, so somehow, we need to tell this point not to be here, but just a tiny bit off the surface, and then it casts out the ray. Um, so this is a bug that I experienced like half the time for half the particles, depending on rounding, um, stuff like that. Um, so I guess let's uh, include this. So really, the only thing we need to change here is the source position. I'm just going to move it a tiny bit. So again, what's happening here is a, a consequence of how raycast works. Can't be avoided. So for the hit position, I'm just going to modify it a bit. We're going to take it, and I want to subtract away the original hit position. So we're kind of taking um, initial minus final or final minus initial. doesn't really matter. I'm going to take that vector, so that's the difference. I'm going to scale it by not 1, but like 0.99. So in other words, this is saying how much did we change by. I'm going to say change it by 99%, not 100. And then I'm going to add that change back onto the original. So again, the only idea we've done here is we've taken our original and we've shifted it to the next position, but by just 99%. So let's see if this changes anything. We now connect that to the source position and boom, you can see it goes to the next stage. Um, in fact, because this is such a repetitive bug, I think this is something to make into a node group. So I'm just gonna take all this, control G, and you can think of this as our kind of 99% uh, correction term. It just takes the previous hit position, the new hit position, and calculates uh, the next one, right? It's an iterative process. Um, and since this is now a, a node group we have, uh, let's use it in the last step as well, just to make sure that this is a foolproof. Uh, so we need the original, original position here. So again, this is all recursive, all the way down. We take the position, take the new one, connect it to the next iteration. Boop. And you can see that even uh, changed the position of the sphere a bit. So I, I guess it really does matter. So let's see what we have so far. We have our uh, particle. Again, it's just a point we paste on the sphere after. We have it in the middle. We cast it. We cast it. We cast it. Beautiful. And again, um, all of this is dependent on some original vector that we can change. So if I set this to like 0.5, and let's uh, undo all our set positions. Now, instead of going like on 1, 1, like it did before, uh, now it should go on 1.5, so something like that. Let's see that in action. Uh, I almost drew it perfectly. So you can see now it goes to a different location. It bounces, beautiful, and it bounces. And you can see um, it does our calculation perfectly. Sometimes it's going to go further distance than before, whatever. Um, so... Let's say that we're happy with this number of collisions. If you want another collision, you literally just repeat this process, another ray cast, nothing uh, special here, and more uh, reflection and all that. Um, okay, so let's say with that we're happy with this kind of basic network. Uh, let's kind of take it up a notch and try it with a bunch of points, and then we need to animate it and actually make it look like it's a thing we can hit play on and it looks good. So I'm going to reset all our positions. So it's back to the middle. And uh, let's check if this works with more than just one point, right? Because this should be generalizable. Generalizable. Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying, by the, by the way, might be good to bundle that together. What I'm saying is this time, instead of just using a single point, um, let's use a couple points. So for example, uh, we could take a grid. So I am kind of changing what we're doing here. So here we have a three by three grid that I can make a tiny bit smaller. So this generates nine points, because again, a grid is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine vertices. 
each of these gets mapped to a new position, and then a sphere is instanced. So let's see what happens. So you can see they're all casted. They're all kind of going in the same direction, but they're going to hit at different points. They get casted. They get casted. They get casted. And it's kind of hard to tell if this is correct when you don't see it in motion. Uh, but believe me when I say it is, and we'll put it in motion in a moment. Uh, but you can see uh, it's working. If we were to change this back to the original vector, 1-1, one, one, you can see now they're all traveling together, but kind of the, to the top right. Beautiful. Okay, um, so I'm thinking next, there's still a couple things left to do here. Uh, we need to, one, animate this thing nicely so I don't have to move these sliders myself. And uh, two, maybe we should have the thing where it kind of glows green if it hits the corner, whatever we define. We'll see if we want to do that. Uh, but definitely, 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 uh, we want to animate this thing. So uh, what is our animation? Our animation is basically going to be some function we're going to make that somehow moves these sliders, but not all together. Because you can see it's a bit weird when they all travel to their end destination together. Because this particle only has a tiny, tiny trip to make it here. Whereas this one has a much further one and therefore will take more time. So they're going to be out of sync is what it would look like ideally. So somehow we need to capture that idea. So here's how I'm going to do it. And this is kind of, this is the part I struggled with almost the most. I might need a cut here if I can't figure it out on the fly because it's a bit complicated. Um, here's what I came up with. We're going to take a scene time node. Again, if you do not have this in 3.1, consider getting 3.1. Or just type in a value node hash frame. That's going to give you the frame number, which is this uh, output. It's just nicer to have it in a node. Um, so we're going to take the frame number. So this is time, so we no longer need keyframes, right? I'm going to take it. I'm going to divide it by, let's say, 30. The reason I'm doing this is if you just take the frame number, it's going to be too fast. Divide it by 30, and it will be slower. So here, you can see we've animated it. If we didn't have this divided by 30, it'd be instant. You wouldn't be able to see it happen. So there we go. Much slower. And if we set it to a tiny number, it's going to be faster. Like, you get the idea. Okay, so we still have, so now we actually have an animation, it's continuous, uh, but we still have the issue where some particles, I mean, they all take the same amount of time, uh, even though there are different distances. In other words, they're going at different speeds. This one, notice, is going much slower than this one. So to correct for this, we somehow need to extract the information, how far is it going, and account for that. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to divide it by another number. What number? Well, notice we have this output in the raycast. It almost seems like raycast does everything we'd ever want, right? It tells us where is it going to hit on the screen? What is the normal at that point? But also the hit distance. How far away uh, is the distance for a hit, right? It's exactly what it sounds like. So take the hit distance. We're going to divide by it. So if it's a big distance like this particle, it's going to divide by a big number. So time should be, I mean, time should all be made the same after this. Let's let's see it. There we go. So you can see the, the whole idea behind this is now they're kind of all going at the same speed before uh, the speed was fully n dependent on time, but not the distance. Uh, but you take distance divided by time, or the inverse in this case. And you can see, you, you understand the idea. Basically, now they're all going at the same speed so that they accumulate, right? It takes time for them all to get there. So now the question is, uh, we want to take it to the next step. Uh, position so it does the collision how do we do that and it's not as obvious as you know taking the same thing you take time and you divide it by the next hit position because we need to know which ones are done with the first transformation and can move on to the second one and notice this one's done but this one isn't so they're going to be out of sync so we need need to uh, somehow figure it out so hopefully i can figure this out on the fly i believe what i did is first of all we have this time function we can literally frame this right so we have frame number divided by 30. So just think of that as time, right? Uh, we divided it by the hit distance. That's our first function. We want to know when it's done with this first part, each particle, which is going to be out of sync, right? We know it's done when it's set all the way to one, like the slider has moved up to one. In other words, we need to know when this input is greater than or equal to one because it's going to go past it. So in other words, this node tells us which particles are done with this transformation. And then we want to say, uh, whatever function we make here, we multiply it by this, which tells us, yes, move on to the next step. And that will uh, be the plug-in there. So I believe the way we want to do this, 
is it's the same idea as before, where it's recursive. You need the previous step to go on to the next step. In this case, we need to know which ones are done with the previous step so we can move on to the next one. So I believe what we want to do is we take our time. So again, this is all its own thing. It's just time. I'm going to subtract away the previous hit position is the idea. So I want to know this node should tell us a time minus the hit distance. In other words, when has time, we care about the positive numbers, when has it surpassed the amount of distance that it needs to travel in some sense, right? And when it does that, I believe we want to do the same thing as before. We want to divide by the hit distance, but this time we're going to a new location, so we need the new ray cast. So first of all, I'm going to check if it works, and then if it does, I'll be like, yes, this is what I meant the whole time. Um, so this should be our new function, but we don't want to just plug it in because if we do that, it's going to be doing some weird stuff. Is it doing weird stuff or does that make sense? That almost seems like it makes sense. Because what I was thinking is the last thing we need to do is we need to now multiply this with the, uh, the thing that says, are we done with the first step? But let's see, maybe it just doesn't make a difference. I need to think through that one. I'm not 100% sure. So for now, I'm going to keep this greater than thing, but unclear whether or not it's necessary. Uh, but you can see um, this now has the collision and it's correct and it's all going at the uh, same speed. And now uh, we just need to do one more of these to have the second collision. So it should be the same idea. So we're going to take time. We are this time going to subtract away, I think, the accumulation, right? So we're on step three. So we need to know when are we done with step one and two in this case. So I'm thinking, we'll see if I'm wrong about this. We need the first hit distance added with the second one because it needs to have traveled both distances. And this is one thing about the nodes. It's very hard to see when you have this many nodes. So again, this little addition node takes the previous hit distance from here and this one. We want to know when has time surpassed both of these, the addition of them. When it's done that, we want to scale it, right, and divide it by uh, this new hit distance so that we're, they're all traveling at the same speed, same idea. And I believe, I mean, it's unclear whether this greater than matters or not. So let's see without it. No, that seems to be fine. So we let's follow one particle, this one, to be uh, clear. So we're going to bounce, bounce, perfect. So it's, I don't know why. Uh, I guess I really would need to think about why the greater than is not necessary. But just to make sure, I'm going to plug it in. So our previous step, I'm going to see where is it greater than 1. And I'm going to multiply, just like last time. Boop. Multiply, connect. So... There we go. We have two collisions. So at this point, you can see how you can generalize. Do you want more collisions? Just keep this process going. You can use node groups to make it nice and simple, right? It doesn't have to end up being this monster. Um, but now uh, let's talk about kind of the last part of this. And I guess before we do that, and the last part is just giving these things colors if they hit the corner. Uh, before we do that, I just want to reemphasize this whole thing's procedural, right? Add more vertices, maybe not that many. They're all going to collide. It's going to look a bit weird, but this is correct. In fact, uh, what we can do with this is we can use a random distribution for our points. Let's go back to frame one. I'm going to make a lot of these. I'm going to make our grid a bit bigger so we can have more points distributed. And you can see very quickly we're getting a cool looking simulation that looks like it's a thing we simulated with physics, but really it's not. It's just a bunch of ray casts and a bunch of clever math uh, brought to you by me, CG Matter. Um, so last thing we want to do, uh, whether we spawn this from, okay, you know what? One more thing, one more thing. So, uh, again, we can also change the direction like I talked about. So now we're colliding in a different direction. Just remember all that works. Just one thing I want to mention, and this is what I showed in the beginning. Um, you can have the direction not be the same for all of these. Cause right now we just have a vector so that they all go the same way. But if we use a noise texture, each one can accrue its own direction. So for example, I'm going to take a noise texture. I'm just doing vector math for this reason. Uh, the reason is I want to make sure there's nothing on the z-axis. So I'm multiplying it by zero. So we just have an x and y vector. And then because I believe it's a zero to one on x and y, I'm just going to subtract both of these by 0.5. So in other words, we take a noise vector for each point. We make sure the z is suppressed, and then we make sure it's mapped between negative and positive 0.5 is the idea. Connect this here, and now you can see they're all going to go a different direction, determined by the noise. 
if you take the detail down and the scale down, it should look a bit more cohesive. Yeah, so you can see how points that are next to each other travel in a very similar direction to begin with, almost like this fabric uh, being pulled apart. Okay, so now for the last thing that I keep saying now, the last thing, but this time for real. Uh, we want to make a little function and a little material that tells us uh, when the thing has hit the corner, because that's kind of the last piece of logic I haven't included yet. Um, so for the input, I'm going to say, let's keep it simple again. So I'm going to go back to the mesh line. Again, this is just the points that we're doing the math on. I'm going to have a single point. So that again, uh, we pick the direction and it collides. And what I want to do is I'm going to hand pick a, a, a direction where it hits the corner. And because this is all predetermined, which is kind of a weird way to look at it, it's not physics. We know where it's going to be on every single frame. I can pick a direction such that it's going to hit the corner. So I'm going to go right there. So you can see it's still doing the collisions if we zoom in. Hit, hit, like it, it still does it. Uh, but we've picked a direction where we know it's going to hit the corner. Um, and we want to make a little function that again says, oh, we did it. Now for hitting the corner, uh, like I mentioned in the previous video, in the CG Matter video, really do watch that if you haven't. Uh, hitting the corner is like, oh, I mean, it's not impossible. You can pick the perfect vector, but almost always, pretty much always, you know, um, unless it's an act of fate, you know, act of God. Um, it's always going to hit somewhere here and do a double bounce. So when I say hit the corner, I just mean be close enough. So how are we going to say that mathematically? Well, close enough basically says this point at, at one of its collision areas, one of the places it hits, uh, was at some distance away from the corner. And we say that distance is very tiny. It was like within a centimeter is kind of the idea we want to express here. And notice that, again, these hit positions are described with the raycast nodes. Uh, so for each of these, uh, we can ask, was it near any of the corners? So we need the uh, coordinates of the corners. So we can literally just add an empty, put it at the corner. And I think I, sh I know what it should be, but at the corner, that's negative 0.8, blah, blah, blah. I believe, let's multiply that by two. Yeah, so that's 1.778, that number from before, that aspect ratio divided by two. Okay, so here's what we want to do. Um, and there might be a cleaner way to do this, but whatever. I want to describe the four corners, the four locations. The first one is negative 1.778 divided by two. So that's this left side, negative X, and 0.5, I believe. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I think the thing is one tall, but let me just make sure. So again, add the empty, put it here. Yeah, 0.5 roughly. I mean, exactly once you do it correctly. So that's the first corner. The second corner is the same thing, but this is positive. The next two corners are the same thing, but the Y is reversed. So I've literally just created four vectors for the four corners. Negative. 1.778 divided by 2 on this side, plus 0.5, minus 0.5, and then the flipped. And we want to say, is this hit position within some distance of any of these corners? Uh, to calculate the distance, we have an easy way to do that. Vector math, take one of these corners, take the hit position, and we literally calculate the distance. Boop. So it literally just outputs the distance, and I'm going to create four of these. And of course, we're going to turn this into a node group so that we don't have to make it for the next ray cast, etc. So you can see how everything here iterates. It's super simple. Just looks like a lot of nodes, to be honest. Okay, so we have our four distances. And we want to say, um, are any of these within uh, some threshold? Um, so I guess there's probably a clean way to do this. But I, kind of the naive approach, I'm thinking, is we see... If this distance, and this should just output one number, right? Because we have a hard set vector here, and this hit position is one vector for each particle. So I want to say, is it within 0.1 distance? And we could define that later. So I'm just going to make a couple of these, one for each of these. And again, what we're doing here is we're saying, for each uh, corner evaluation, is it within some threshold? And I guess... Uh, we should have a value node for each of these. So we can pick the same threshold. So it's going to output 1 if it is within the threshold, 0 otherwise. And I'm thinking, since it's only going to hit one corner at a time, right? It can't be at two corners at once. 
Uh, let's just add them, right? Why not? Take it, add it, add it, add it. So in other words, this whole group, and I guess, did I change anything there? I feel like I did. No. Uh, this whole group that I'm just going to move off to the side uh, will output um, a number between 0 and 1. 1 meaning it was within some threshold of one of the corners, doesn't really matter which, and 0 if it wasn't. In other words, it will tell us whether or not it was near a corner. Take it, control G, and we want to make sure this thing outputs that 0 to 1, so we'll group output. Beautiful. So all of that compresses down to this kind of simple node. In fact, uh, we copy it use it for the next hit position, and that will tell us in the next collision, the next thing, will it happen? And then again. And then, uh, yeah. So I, I guess there's two things we could do with this. We could somehow combine them in a way that says, did it hit a corner at any time? Or we could combine it in a way that says, tell us when it hit a corner. The difference between those concepts is one tells us at the end of the day, uh, after it did the three collisions, did it coll was it near a corner? And the other one says, when did it happen on collision one, two, or three? Um, so there's two things we could do with this. I'm thinking let's have the one that tells us when. So we could say it's white, 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 and then when it hits the corner, flash green. And I think the function for that is you literally just add these things because what's going to happen is they're all going to be set to zero, but eventually... Hmm? Maybe, maybe this isn't the correct function. I think maybe the correct function is to use these and multiply them with the time so that it happens after... What am I trying to say? This will tell us, did it hit in general? And if we multiply it with our time functions, it will kind of take time to know that information. Uh, but for now, let's just use this and see what happens. So I'm thinking, okay, we have all this. Uh, we set position, and we want to send this information, basically this new field we created, this very complicated one. We want to send that to the material editor. So I'm thinking the easiest way to do that is I'm going to capture the attribute. I'm trying to think if it matters before or after set position. I don't believe it does, but I'm going to do it after. So e either way, we have our points distributed. In this case, one point. Set position tells it where to go the, co the uh, collisions, and then we're going to capture this did it hit a corner information and uh, send it out of here. So output attributes, I'm going to call it corner hit. There won't be a question mark, but in our heads we'll, we'll say it like that. Corner hit, did it, did Susie really bang tr Tristan? And, uh, you know, that's the thing. So, and we want to use that information to again color these spheres but we'll get to that in a second. So first of all, let's make our material now. Shader editor. We're going to call this balls, because who doesn't like that? Men like their balls, women like ball. Who doesn't like balls? Uh, so this attribute is going to be corner hit, so it's going to import in this data from geometry nodes. And let's try to visualize this. Oh, by the way, the cube is going to be in the way. That's what's happening here. We just want to see the points. And we're also not going to see the information because I guess the material is not applied. So let's uh, set material to the ball thing. So let's see if this does anything. So it's black the whole way, which tells me uh, we probably did something wrong. But just to make sure, uh, we want to make sure that we realize instances. Oh, that could have been it. Okay, so it's white. That is correct because it indeed did hit a corner. Uh, to test if this is correct, though, let's pick a vector where this is not going to hit a corner. Okay, so that was one where it definitely did not hit a corner, uh, but it's still glowing white, which tells me error, error, there was an issue. Uh, let's just make sure everything we did was uh, correct. So we're taking our hit position. We're saying take that input, calculate the distance... Let me, let me move this over. There we go. Calculate the distance between each of these. Tell me when it's greater than some... Th oh, 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 big error, big error. Less than, less than. I don't know if this will fix it, but I, th I believe this is true. We want to know if it's within a threshold, not bigger than. There we go. Okay, 
Don't scream at me. I'm sorry. Okay, it was only like 30 seconds, but I believe I fixed it. So the only thing I changed is in this uh, node group, I made the uh, threshold thing that we had before, this value thing. I just kind of took it out of the uh, group uh, so that we could control it externally here. And I made sure it was all the same threshold. So you can see when I make the threshold um, a certain size, it flashes between black and white. So it does matter. Um, and the only other thing I changed, so first of all, I moved the threshold outside of it. Uh, second of all, I think I showed on screen, I changed these all to uh, less than. And I think the last and most important detail that I was unsure about, capture attribute before set position, not after. So I was debating before if it mattered. It seems like it does. And uh, when I think about it, I believe it makes sense because if we do it after set position, it's almost like the transformation isn't part of the equation. But it should happen as it's happening. So before the set position. Either way, let's let's uh, test it. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell uh, Blender, uh, give us a white particle if it's within 0 0.05 of the uh, corner. So let's see. So this says it's white, so it should be very close to a corner. Okay, so that looked like it was, like it did that double collision thing. And now let's move the vector, the direction that it started in, just a bit off to the side, and it should flash black. Okay, so this is telling us it's no longer near a corner, and it isn't. Beautiful. Let's uh, do one more test. So I'm going to now create a vector in the other direction, and we're going to just wait for it to flash white, and when it does, it better uh, then hit a corner. So let's see, I'm just increasing it. Okay, so it was white right there. So this should hit a corner within the number of collisions. There we go. So that was the corner. Maybe this was the corner. Let's visualize this with the uh, cube. Yeah, that's exactly the corner. Okay, so we have a uh, thing that works. Uh, to make this uh, kind of more interesting, I guess let's try it with a bunch of points and see if it makes sense. So same thing as before. I'm just replacing the number of points we're making uh, with this grid. And uh, we can make it so that the grid has a bunch of randomly distributed points. Take it, distribute points, and let's make this bigger. So you can see uh, from this distribution, uh, some of these hit the corners and some don't. So let's test it. And just to make it uh, more clear where the corners are, I'm just going to add in this plane object so we can visualize it. Uh, the plane will be 1. 7, 7, 8 on the x-axis. So this isn't part of geometry nodes. This is just to visualize it. And in the viewport, I'm going to make it a wire. There we go. So now we can see the bounds of the screen. So what this should do, if it's correct, is we have our initial distribution. We play it. It does the thing. Um, any particle that is white should at some point in the simulation get very close to a corner. So let's follow this one. So nothing yet, nothing yet. Boom. That's a corner hit within our means. Uh, let's follow this one. I guess this is kind of a boring direction to pick. Uh, because it's always going to kind of accumulate there. Um, let's do a more interesting direction. And you can see these will now kind of flash differently once we pick our vector. Whoops. So it's kind of interesting. We get to on the fly see which of these are going to work and which ones won't. So let's see this one. Yeah, so all these white ones hit that corner and all the black ones don't, which makes sense. Okay, uh, beautiful. So really, the only thing that I would change about this is that, you know, I'd say instead of black and white, make it glowing and stuff like that. And if we wanted to do a color swap, just so you know how to do it, right? We send it through a color ramp. We say white, make it green. Boom, you've done it. It's easy. Um, and you make it flashier. You make it glow. You add more collisions. But that's the essence of it. And now let's try using the noise, which is way less predict predictable. So follow the green ones. Make sure that at some point, boom, corner hit. Let's follow this top one. Yep, corner hit. And uh, notice that when we make our thresholds, again, this value controls all these node groups. When we make this more sensitive, closer to zero, uh, this one no longer hit the corner because it's not that close, right? But you raise the threshold and you, yeah. And notice if you make the threshold big enough, they've all hit a corner. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's the essence of it. So now that we just have two particles, super easy to visualize. I'm going to follow this one. Yeah, that's a very close corner hit. And now for the other one, that's a very close corner hit. So there you go. 
Okay, so you can see, uh, this is the node group. The only difference between this and the original, the one I made uh, originally, is uh, more collisions and a bit more fancy stuff, a bit more um, visually interesting. Like, the, the particles get a bit bigger if there's a hit, stuff like that. But, like, this is the essence. This is the core engine. So, at this point, how long have we been going? Dear Lordy, this is like a Patreon-exclusive tutorial. I never go this on Patreon, though, I do. And that uh, brings me to the next point. Uh, Patreon, it exists. Hello, uh, patrons. So what you're seeing right now is the credit list of 730, maybe a bit more, um, active patrons. And here's why you should join. Why? Here's why you should click that link in the description. So um, active patrons get a bunch of stuff other than uh, being able to support this channel and the CG Matter channel, free tutorials. Uh, one, you get the blend files. So this thing, or rather the one I made before the fully complete version, you can download. Once you get Patreon, you can get that one. Uh, or once you become a patron, you can get that one. I've been on Patreon for three years, so any blend file I've uploaded over those three years, you can also download. So hundreds of blend files, including this one. Just get access to it immediately. Uh, two, um, early access to tutorials. That's almost always the case. Uh, sometimes if there's sponsor stuff, I have to like do some weird stuff with that. But generally, uh, this week, there was a tutorial that was uploaded a week early uh, because of stuff like that. But in general, you get tutorials at least a day early, sometimes multiple days early. And finally, uh, number three, exclusive tutorials. I make some tutorials, at least one a month that goes on long, like this one, in depth, um, that only certain patrons get access to. So if you want that, check it out. I already did one for this month, and I'm trying to remember what it was. I know the last one was the uh, procedural Ritz Cracker. I cannot, for the life of me, remember what it was. I don't know. Either way, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very scattered brain. Go to the Patreon and uh, find out what it is, because you get to see what it is. Uh, oh, it was the inverted bagel. It was the inverted bagel from the uh, tilted uh, tutorial. I said how to, that was like an hour long tutorial. Either way, if any of that interests you, Patreon exists. It's a great way. It's the best way to support uh, both of my channels uh, and you get stuff in return. So either way, hopefully you enjoyed this uh, 50 some minute tutorial. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.